very happy with that person. So, um, let's do a little bit of recap. Can somebody maybe tell me what the Laplace equation is? Number square of phi equals zero. Number square of phi equals zero. That's the valuation. How much is Well, this is, is, the, is the homogeneous Poisson equation, which is a perfectly valid equation in physics, but not the one we, we're going to use. This was for statics, yes? Yeah. All right, I want the Laplace yeah. equation. Exactly. It's very easy. I just replace this, this front triangle by a square. A square. By a square. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. By the way, this doesn't tell anyone anything, right? I mean, I just <laughs> changed the notation. The notation means something. And the notation, of course, means this one minus ddt squared. That one, well, 1 over c squared equals 0. This is not plus equation, but it's a homogeneous one. Yeah. Okay, so let's make it a homogeneous, an inhomogeneous one. So what should I put here? Yes, of t and Yes, and which particular source? In this particular notation, I write phi, so oh, that's fine. Okay, so which source would that be? It would be a minus rho by epsilon zero. Yes. And that's the whole thing, right? Now it depends on space and on time. This is how you get your dynamics in this. So it's this equation that we have to solve. Now, of course, the vector potential is three equations that look extremely the same. The only thing you have to do is replace the scalar potential by the vector potential. And what you do is you replace your your charge density by current. There you go. And of course, one of the epsilon zero becomes mu zero. Between these things are one, so I don't care about this one. So, what do they mean? Just as a, so we all understand what we're doing here. Physically, what do they mean? I'm sure we yeah. talked about this for at least two lectures, so somebody, somebody should have picked this up. I think it essentially basically describes how um, a current or charge density, basically how it uh, influences what the scalar and vector potentials will be, or how they will behave. That's all there is to it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a dynamical equation, it's an equation of motion. It's something that, that tells the scalar field and the uh, vector field how to move given that there is this amount of charge and this amount of current producing them. And this is the most general one, right? We spent lots of time getting to this point with all the H's and the rewriting of the Maxwell's equation, but here we are. So, this, mentioned this many times before, is all of electrodynamics. Everything you want to know about electrodynamics is in there. Light, Snell's law, refraction, uh, induction, right-hand rules, left-hand rules, all these things are all in here. All of this is this. So, uh, except for the quantum part. Quantum stuff is not in there. Science is uh, relatively easy in there as well. Everything is really in there. Now, um, it would be good if we had a general solution to this equation. And the equation looks. Here's a notation. We didn't call it by this pen, by the way. So, current theme. You've got a red one? You need to do the third one. Oh, oh you, you have. I do. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, you can choose this. Oh, well, let's go for the red one. Thank you. Right, good, great. Extra points for the video. <laughs> no, no, no. Didn't say anything. So, the uh, equation is of this particular form. Equals source. Yes, it's the inhomogeneous Laplace equation. And now, what is the solution? I gave you the general solution. Our object is to prove that that's need a solution. Do you remember what the solution was? Here to you two days ago. It's one over four pi. Minus. Minus one over four pi, yes. Uh, integral of um, S as a function of retarded time and sweeping R. And sweeping R divided by R dB. And you mean big R, yes? Yes, big R. And then you integrate over all space, all of the universe. Okay, that's good. And the retarded time, 
as you remember, was defined as T minus C. R over C. And which R? Big R. Big R, okay. And we gave this interpretation to this, yes? It makes perfect sense from a physical perspective. By the way, it only makes perfect sense uh, from a physical perspective because we prior had already proved that uh, electromagnetism moves with the speed of light. Otherwise, this 1 over C would not have been that obvious. So this is why we spent quite some time proving that that is the case. Good. Okay, so it makes perfect sense. Let's see whether this thing indeed solves this differential equation before we do so. Just see if you remember this from you know, our discussions over the last couple of lectures. Do you think that this is the only solution? My, the sound of my voice gives a lot away. But, uh, okay, but do you remember when I gave you the solution to the Poisson equation? I made some comments on that. It's a solution. It's a general. It's a general solution, but is it the, the only general solution? Well, the solution could be anything because it was a. Uh, the result that we got was a function that could be Fourier transformed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was a Fourier function that was itself. Was for this one? Ah, okay. So. Well, you, we we uh, impose some uh, restriction on what solution we actually want because not all of them accurately describe the things we want. Yes. Right. As a general rule, differential equations typically give you more solutions than the one that you actually want, right? So sometimes the is you have to artificially throw away some solutions. Um, and so we solve the uh, inhomogeneous Poisson equation, the same thing without the DDTs here. Uh, I made a similar point. I gave you its solution. In fact, it was the same thing without the retarded time in there. And the point that I made there was a, a solution like this is only true uh, for a particular set of boundary conditions. Right? So by writing down this particular solution, I've already assumed something about the solution. Now, if you want a different boundary uh, condition, as in you want solutions general, but they have to obey, also have to obey such and such, some other physical condition, then this is probably not the way to go. Now, for the people interested, you don't have to know this for any exam in any near future in this course, but for people who are interested to know about this, I posted uh, a couple of pages on a later on Green's function theory, and where they explain, uh, first of all, how Green's functions work, and also something about the boundary conditions. Remember there, that I told you two days ago that a differential operator, in this case that will be Lambertson, comes with a Green's function. And if you know the Green's function of a particular operator, differential operator, then you know every single solution that there is to that differential equation. That was a good thing. So right, remember that I said that the crappy thing about Green's functions is somebody first has to find the damn thing, but once you have it, you have solved all problems for eternity, for that particular differential equation. And then I think you made the funny joke that somebody then had to write this book and <laughs> prove it, <laughs> prove it the thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, but all these Green's functions are only true up to the boundary conditions. If you want different boundary conditions, the Green's functions change accordingly. Now, so this is a general solution for the particular boundary conditions, being that the fields themselves go to zero at infinity. Okay. Now, how to proceed? We want to prove that this f is a solution. <laughs> you plug it into the Laplace equation. Yes, let's do that. So we have to evaluate two things. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to do this one and that one. Okay. Um, so which one to start with? It's the two derivatives, and then show whatever if you take the two uh, spatial derivatives here and the two uh, temporal derivatives there, that apparently both of them give something, and those two thumbs somethings together should give you s. So we have to evaluate both. Yeah. We have to do them both, so... I think it's easier if we start from the spatial one. The spatial one? Yeah. Why is it easier? Uh, it's, not, it's not that it's easier, but... Um, it's similar to what we did it, before. It's more complete. I mean, I don't know, I, I found it, I found it uh, more... Straightforward. You you already done it? You uh, yeah, I went through it. Did you get did you get indeed that it equals s? Uh, yeah. Good. Okay, so we know at least one other person that this is the correct solution. Okay. Well, this is democracy, but it gives you confidence, yes. Alright, so uh, you say that doing the, this Laplacian to this yeah. to this might actually be a good starting point. Alright. Let's do this here. Yeah, because this, the temporal derivative will come out in a way. Okay. Whatever. So, let's 
So uh, let's start with this. 1 over 4 pi integral squared of st r comma r prime over r. And there's a video there. Uh, are we all, this we've seen, this argument we've seen a couple times before, the passing goes inside the integration, yes. Because you integrate over sweeping coordinates, as I call them, but your differentiation with, with respect to this are the non sweeping ones. So, integration and this particular derivation can be interchanged. So, now what? I remember the other group, in fact, that was you, Ali, right? Who was doing this one before? Yeah, the two weeks ago? No, the last time. Alright, so do you remember there was a step that we got stuck on for a while, but we all really solved it. So plus you yeah. split up into uh, divergence of the we wanted, we wanted to end up with a delta function. Yes. Yeah. And so. we, we, we proved in our first week yeah. a particular rule about delta functions. That the gradient it. of our unit vector over r squared is the, is 4 pi times the delta. So the gradient of the unit vector over Maybe it's divergence. Is it divergence or divergence? It's divergence. It's divergence. Yes. Yes. Okay. And this equals 1 over 4, no, it's 4 pi. 4 pi, yeah. Delta function of our vector, yes. Yeah. We yes. proved this explicitly, and last time when we solved the Poisson equation, <sighs> stroking a beard, that always helps. <laughs> uh, Last time that we uh, did this with the Poisson equation, that actually helped us out. And what we did was that we recognized that a Laplacian really is a divergence of the gradient. So instead of writing not last squared, you might as well write gradient of this thing, and of that thing you end up with, you take its divergence. It's mathematically exactly the same thing. Now, with a little bit of luck, this part now, this gradient, will look something like this ish, because then you end up with your delta function. And as you know, delta function and integrals are a good match. Okay. Next step. Let's take the gradient. Now, with respect to what coordinate is this gradient taken, this spatial derivative? There are a couple of r's in there, which of the r's we need when we try to the unprimed one, the small r. Now, small r is built into this whole thing in a couple of different places. First of all, big r is itself uh, small r minus small r prime. And uh, now, as a new feature that we didn't have with the Poisson equation, the retarded time itself comes with this big R, and therefore with small r. So the derivative is going to be a little bit more complicated. You'd have to take a partial derivative, I guess, with respect to just r, or with respect to the retarded time. Yes. Yeah, so do like the chain yes. rule. Yeah, but this extended chain rule, yeah. right? It comes with two terms now. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, let's go with that. Uh, before, in the Poisson case, uh, the whole source only depended on, on the sweeping r and went outside of the derivations. You know, you have to worry, worry about it for a while, yes. Now, not so much this time. So, in the Poisson case, you only need to take this derivative. But now, life is more complicated. So, yes. Um, oh, and aside from that, we still have to take this derivative. Yeah. So, uh, let's do it like this. I think this is going to equal str r primed. Uh, oh, one more. I'm 
find a product rule differentiation now, but yes, that is true, certainly in case of you know, one-dimensional functions, one-dimensional derivatives, but this is a gradient. I think it actually extends to the dimension. Yeah. Yes, that is true. But I want you to note that whatever you think is probably true for one-dimensional uh, calculus does not necessarily hold here. Yeah, there's only certain things. Yes. You have to prove this first. <coughs> Now, I think this part is now becoming somewhat easier, yes? Mm -hmm. Because this thing we have solved before, the gradient 1 over r, we have seen before. So let's not go through the whole derivation. But this thing in its own is going to be r hat over r squared. Right? We've proved this thing before. Now, it still comes with s t r and this gradient, um, yeah, now has to be done with uh, the chain rule. Yes. Okay. So you dictate what shall this be? Um, ds by dr. Uh, yes, but which ds is that? Capital S. Oh, capital S by dr. By dt, right? First, because you first. Take the derivative with respect to tr. Yeah. No, no, yeah. No. So I mean, that's the chain. That's the chain. Uh, uh, d, yeah. Dtr by dr times ds. And, and then which dtr by which r? Mm, small r. Well, unprimed. Unprimed, yeah. Okay, but this is. Mm, this? No, no, not primed. Okay. This one? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> that is the R that you be as encapsulated on the map, right? Yes. But the fact is that the small R is itself within the big R. So you yes. have to take the derivative of TR with respect to big R. To big R, and then and take then its derivative. Exactly. So I'm going to change it twice now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, of course. And, and, and now we're not still not done with this first term from the chain rule. <laughs> because then still we have to do uh, the derivative of. Uh, uh, is this no, a derivative of s, of course. Yes, yeah. exactly. With uh, respect to um, the tr. Tr, yeah. Good. Now, we're still not done with the chain rule. We have to do another term. Can you tell me what it is? Well, that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah, you're right. There you go. But well, it's a vector as well. It is, yes. Now, um, a couple of things are going, to, are going to be much easier. But where's the vector uh, component here? Because you wrote it down scalars. Yeah, but we're taking this grid. Uh, yes, I agree. But should it be um, unit capital R again? Yeah. Sorry? Should it be the unit vector of capital R again? Oh, yes, that's true. Yes. All of these goes with this one, points in that direction. Good. Now, a couple of these things we can immediately put in, because uh, tr, the, the tr of the r, we know what it is, yes? This, 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 this guy is derivative. And uh, if my mathematical skills are correct, it just gives you uh, minus 1 over c. So, there's this. Uh, dr, dr. Right, so to do this with respect to big R, I gave you 1 over C with a minus, that's this minus. It's just one. Uh, yes, and then dr, big R, uh, with respect to R, is just going to give you 1. So, there you go. This one, all of this drops out. Okay, good. Uh, fine. Then all of this is now done. We still have this one to go. All of this has become, uh, uh, this part is done, we're working on this one. I think we're done, yes. Well, you're missing ds over dtr. No, uh, yes, I'm sorry, I just said we erased it. Yeah. So it's ds over dtr, you're right. And this, all of this is our direction. But now we're done. And all of this 
we still have to take the gradient, uh, excuse me, the divergence. Now, there's multiple ways to continue here. Uh, one trick that you might think of is, hey, let's see if we can make this into a delta function. Mm -hmm. Is that how you did this? Mm -hmm. Did you try to work the delta function in here? That's certainly one way no, to do it. No, I just took the gradient of that, and of course the gradient of, for whatever the diversion of our height over our square gives you the delta function. Okay. But you still have to use a, apply the chain of the yeah, yeah. So that's how we okay. And, and then you also do it here, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's sort of like the same thing, but not quite, because R hat over R. So we have to think a little bit harder here. Um, oh, I was thinking about applying the, the divergence here, but that certainly will not work. Why is that? I almost did it, because I said there's multiple ways of doing this. The divergence is not the same as the integral, or exactly. the same r? This is sweeping coordinates, and the divergence is with respect to the non sweeping coordinates. So we cannot use the divergence here. So. All right. Next step, let's take divergences. Somebody help me. It's going to be handy to first we'll just write out all the following rules and take rules and actually get the pure and out of the pattern. Is it what we use? No. No. I missed the suggestion. What? Um, maybe the first all of them can write out all the following rules and chain rules that we're going to run into. Oh, so I see. What exactly we have to do. As in just literally let this be the thing go all the way through and see what we come up with? I guess I yeah. Doing this real time, guys, so uh, we really have to pay attention to whether or not necessarily making mistakes. Uh, for divergence, um, you can use the, uh, just the basic product rule, yes? Okay. Is there actually a product rule there? Well, uh, there is uh, still a bar uh, here, it has to take the oh, okay. So, yes, it is still there. <coughs> I wondering if you can simplify it a little. I mean, maybe we can first work out the divergence of R hat over R, and maybe it will become something easier so we don't have to write everything out. Yeah, but, but remember, if you're not taking the divergence of only this thing, yes, you take the divergence of this thing. Yeah, but it's a part we will have to do at some point anyway. Uh, um, yes. Uh, let's see. But there's one thing that I'm thinking about right now. Namely, we're going to apply the divergence. Uh, so let's focus on this one for a second. This one consists of a vector times a scalar. Now, how does a product rule work for divergence that operates on a vector times a scalar? The scalar just sort of means it's a constant factor, right? No, but the scalar is also dependent on. The R that we are yes. taking the divergence. So if you would just blindly, as you know from the four dimensional calculus, if you would just blindly apply uh, the product rule, you would say, oh, you know what, I'm just first going to take the divergence of this thing and leave this one as is. Fine, you end up with a vector. But that, that is, uh, excuse me, this one, apply that one, it gives you a scalar, times out the scalar, gives you a scalar, that's fine. Yeah. Now, but if you would uh, then to do the next term of your product rule, you would have to apply this one. To that one, and it gives you a vector. And it gives you, uh, yeah, it gives you that a, is a vector. The two vectors will simplify because it's a product between two r hat vectors. Okay, so it's a scalar. So are you saying you you have to do this one on that one, but not a divergence of? Right, you cannot take the divergence of a scalar. This is a scalar. Yeah, it's okay. the, yeah. I mean, that's how I did it. I don't know if it's okay. So maybe we should check that formal, first. Hundred percent. No, no, we we should check that first. Yeah. Do we all see the issue here? Mm -hmm. At the moment that you try to apply your standard product rule, you apply this one to this thing, that works because you can take the divergence of this second term and then you just multiply it with the scalar in front. You get a scalar, that is fine, you should get a scalar. But this other term that you would naively use in case you would uh, use your, your, your basic product rule would have you take this thing, operate on that thing, but you cannot take the divergence of the scalar. 
So apparently something is not working uh, entirely. Now what I think that Simon has done, and I cannot see his notes, but what I think that he has done is that he has taken the gradient of this thing, then this thing has become a vector, and then took that vector <coughs> inner product with this vector. I'm sure that this is what you've done, Simon. Can you check? I'm, I'm checking right Yes. And if you said that you are allowed to do that, right? Yes, I, I know. Mm -hmm. But I, have to, I want to make sure that everybody sees that you kind of just blindly apply yeah. these rules. Right? You have to be extremely careful when putting yeah, numbers yeah, in front. Yeah. yeah? Okay, good. Because I applied the same rule as we did before when we had yes. uh, the delta S. Yeah, we, we did a similar thing the here. Yes, exactly. So we all see that you have to be careful with these things, yes? It, it so happened that I was talking to a student this morning who's following the course in electromagnetism, and this person asked me what a nubla was. I said, well, it's this vector operator thingy. And then she asked, okay, but what does it say? I said, well, it depends what you do with it. We, we, it, it, it. She said, but it's, it's like a derivative, right? It tells you how things are changing in space. I said, yes, but because space is not three-dimensional, there's many ways that things can change in space because there's many directions you can move in in space. So I said, this is why there's, the nabla itself has no real physical or not even a geometrical interpretation. It only gets a geometrical interpretation if you say, if you're going to take the inner product with nabla, the divergence, or the cross product, or curl, or a scalar product, which is a gradient, and only then do you, can you apply uh, an interpretation to it. <coughs> we run into the same thing. It's so easy to think it's derivative, so therefore um, your typical rules hold. Um, I have to make space somewhere. So, tell me what the rule is. The product rule. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, if you have, if you do uh, a dot, so uh, divergence on the brackets, uh, like some scalar times the vector. So, okay. Uh, you have f and a in this, in this Like this? Like this. Okay. Uh, d equals uh, just uh, f. Uh, times uh, nabla dot a. Yes, this is what we are. This is what we are already expecting to have, which is based on our mm. product rule. Yes. Okay. Uh, plus uh, plus the gradient of f. Yes. Exactly. Okay. There you go. So this, I think, is what you did without maybe uh, without knowing. Yeah. Without knowing. Okay. But, but it did work out, right? <laughs> it did okay. work out. That by itself is not a reason to use no, it. Of course. But but <laughs> sure. Okay, so now we know what to do with this thing, and now we still have to work this out. Um, yeah, let's apply it to this first one. Oh my god, I'm going to run out of space very soon. Oh, this continuum wall. Okay, so dictate me. We can also go for the windows, right? We can also go for the windows. <laughs> it's like, like the yeah. NME. Exactly. We wrote the windows here, not for project. Okay, so. Uh, apparently what we have to do is take S T R dot R and this is uh, not sweeping. Uh, this is sweeping. And then take the diversion of this thing, but that one we know, we've solved it many times. That was 4 pi times the delta function of R. So here's 4 pi delta function of R. Okay. Then we still have to uh, do the next step, which is the gradient of S. And then, uh, whatever you end up with, take its divergence with all of this. That's this one. Minus. Uh, well, same story, right? It's 1 over C. I'm going to take ds dtr and take divergence of this thing. And Seth, I think you were proposing maybe to already calculate what the divergence of r hat over r is, right? Yeah, we need really to calculate it at some point. Yeah, we need to calculate it at some point anyway. You're right. So let's do that in a second. Still not done with the product rule here. Then I have to take the gradient of uh, ds. DTR, and then take its divergence with R hat over R, and all of this infinite over all of space. Okay, 
okay, I'm doing this in real time, but I think this is correct until, up until this point. Now, let's see. Um, is there any point to try to simplify from this point on, or should we go with the second time derivatives? Maybe the time derivatives already... It's very really similar to the one before in the case. The, the time. Yeah. Well... You mean the divergence, the gradient of S? This one. Oh, no, no, it will, like, it will come up out of this. Uh, yes, but I'm thinking that maybe we should now continue with the two temporal derivatives and maybe see that a couple of t-terms are already going to drop yeah. out without us having to first evaluate all the separate terms that we yeah. end up with. I mean, both approaches work. It might happen. Um, Let's see uh, if we could sort of already see what's going to happen here. The two derivatives here with respect to time is going to give you this. So you are going to end up with two time derivatives, yet I only have one time derivative here. That's interesting. Yeah, but the fact is that if you remember, as we did earlier, when you take the derivative gradient of S, you get another time derivative. Yes, 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 exactly. Time derivative. yes exactly. Good. So maybe it does pay to develop this a little bit for a certain until we have some time. I really think that if you go one step further as you are right now, yes. you will already end up with a solution. Basically. So you just have to simplify two things okay. that will cancel out. Okay. For lack of space, I will do it here. Maybe for lack of... Uh, Enormous amounts of time, maybe you can already sort of in words say which terms are going to drop out. I'm sure yeah. people don't so have any difficulty to work this out for themselves. So basically, what you get is that the um, yeah, from the divergence of S, we already calculated the gradient of S, we already calculated before there was yes. the S over DTR, 1 over C uh, over R squared as well. Okay. Um, so and you get you get the same exact term, but with a minus from the other um, product. So in one of them, yes. you're taking the gradient of S, right? Yes. Yeah. And instead, when you take the gradient, the um, yeah, the gradient of the the um, divergence of r hat over r, you would get one over r squared. But that one itself is multiplied by the S over dt over c. And so they cancel out with each other. These two, um, this one and these are going to be exactly. Oh, okay. Yes. Good. Um, yes. Do we all see this happening? Because he's uh, exactly right. Right. If you take the uh, the gradient of this thing by the uh, usual chain rule, you end up with uh, d s d t, and exactly one over c because you have to take a derivative due to the chain rule of t r with respect to r. That gives you exactly one of C. It's exactly the same exercise you write as we did before. So uh, this is going to drop out, but not all of it is, right? Um,
I mean, it might just be that this is correct. And this is correct. Wait a minute, Simon. I say that it's both the evaluates who only this. Yep. All of it. Yes. With the TV. Okay. So I think we should do some checking. Okay. Just to be sure. So yes, uh, this on um, that is going to cancel out, you say? Yeah. Maybe that was the divergence here? There's divergence of R hat over R. Yeah, and it's one over R squared. Okay. And that's going to be the best. I agree with that. Exactly. Okay, so those are going to drop out. And, and then the C that you have in there, you can take it out as well. So you have the C squared that you end up. Wait a second, no, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, that one will give you the time derivative, the second time derivative with the RC squared. Um, the only thing that I don't know if it makes sense because uh, the divergence of ds over tr has already in itself minus 1 over c, right? That is true. So you get the C squared. Yeah, that is that is absolutely true. Yeah. Is this minus sign and that minus sign that make gives you the total plus sign? Yeah. Okay. So this should be correct, I think. Yeah. Maybe a uh, problem. Okay. Now I think the first term, and this is going to give us something very easy, yes? Of a of remaining integration. Definitely. And I mean if you look at this now, mm -hmm. you can split the integral in two. Yeah, that's what I'm would. saying, yes. And, and the second term is exactly the, time, the second time derivative of f I agree. as we started. Yes, 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 That's yes, what yes, I meant. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, you're right. But uh, I first have to get, want to get rid of that first term. So, um, yeah. Sure. So, for lack of time and because I really don't want to spend the rest of the, uh, the exercise working out these details because we know how to do this. Yes, it's just algebra here. You have to be a little bit careful with your derivatives and what kind of derivatives you take and such. Is I'm happily uh, accepting Simon's uh, derivation. Um, if you feel that we should check this, do let me know. We're just going to write this out in full. But let's assume that he's right, and I think that he is, because indeed, if you work this out, you get exactly what we have done before. It cancels exactly that one. Now, that means that you end up with this, and uh, here you apply the same uh, chain rule that we did before, we end up with this, and I fully agree with this. Now, final step is, of course, uh, that we have to do something here because we can split up this integral into two terms. Now, if there's one thing that you should not be afraid of despite the two complicated expressions that we have here, an integral and a delta function, is these two things love each other. They're like particles and antiparticles, right? They annihilate. So, you tell me, what do we end up with here? This is going back to our first tutorial. It's just str. Um and then the whole thing is evaluated at just our uh, vector. Yeah. Well, it is evaluated at the big R vector is zero. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, but because R. the integral is over the R prime, and um, R vector is yeah exactly. Okay. I mean, if big R is going to be zero, then it means that the integration of a small of a prime R, sweeping R. Just says okay that sweep all sweeping R's must be replaced by normal R's. So that gives us a minus here. And this minus is at TR, but let's check the TR for a second. Oh yeah, and there is one thing that we forgot, and it's just to prove that the del the, the, the derivative with respect to time is equal to the derivative with respect to the retarded time. Yes. Using the generalized chain. Because oh, otherwise in our formulation right there, yes. we have del s the tr uh, in the uh, what we want to prove. We have del the t, so we have to just prove that they're the same thing. Yeah, that's true. But it's an easy step. To make. Yeah. yeah. This is now, uh, again, the delta function just the rules of delta function on the integral side says replace every capital R here by zero, yes, or which is equivalent to replace every small r by its sweeping r. Now, if in the retarded time, I get to put capital R to zero, the retarded time turn, it turns into a normal R. Hey, that's good. And sweeping R becomes normal R. 
straight up. The minus sign does worry me though. Uh, I was expecting the non minus sign to come out of it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. So and we might. In some textbooks, the definition of the Lambertian is uh, 1 over c squared d by dt yeah. minus the other thing. Uh, so the oh, that might, oh, you know what? That might actually be the, be the case. That yeah. the, the solution that I gave was for these two things as well. Now, that's the easiest thing to check for ourselves. Yeah. To switch the Green's function by a minus sign. There's yeah. no problem there. Now, uh, all of this apparently gives us exactly possibly up to a minus sign because I don't think there's a minus sign issue in the way that we went through the exercise. But that means that all of this will exactly give us this term. But remember, we were only evaluating this integration at this point. Uh, excuse me, uh, where is the original one? This one. Uh, so that's this one, that one. And we still have a term to go. Maybe we still have uh, uh, this one here. Okay. But without going through all the mathematics, can you see that what you have here will uh, give you two time derivatives? Change this thing into time derivatives, yes, using your, using your chain rule. Can you write that out, please? Uh, yes, I'll lose for a second, but just for the overall uh, understanding of things. That this thing uh, will give, ultimately, will give you two time derivatives of your original source. But that's exactly what you would have gotten here by taking two time derivatives of your original expression, this one. So you can sort of already see that these things are going to cancel out. Yeah. Now, if that is the case, then this one is going to cancel out this time derivative, and that means that the only thing you're going to end up with is exactly this x that you should have ended up with. Now note that this final step, this one being cancelled by this one, is in the, is regardless of whether we started with a means function with an overall minus sign. These are going to cancel out regardless, yes. If we have forgotten an overall minus sign, it just means that if this one was a plus, it now becomes a minus, and if this one minus, it becomes a plus, they cancel each other out regardless. So, uh, we're almost done with this one, yes? So what are we missing at this point? Can you please write the general? Yes. Thank you very much. This thing, we have to show, is going to cancel out that thing. Alright? Can I remove this? Just make some space. with uh, a 1 over c, that's this one here, and the s, the t, r, and it's the you know, inner term of the r, omitted what it depended on. But you know what it depends on? It depends on retarded time. And it depends on uh, sweeping R. We have to take the derivative with respect to normal r, and the normal r is in here. Yes? So instead of taking the derivative with respect to normal r, we might as well take the derivative with respect to tr. So you get something like tr over normal r, and then take s uh, with respect to um, tr.
grew this set. I went from here to here. Oh. I'll wait for somebody to make a comment. There is a C missing as well. Uh, I haven't taken any derivatives yet. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, there is one C, and this one will give me another C. Yes, but no comments at the moment. What does this thing do? Divergences. And the divergence is taken with respect to something. Uh, yes. No, excuse me, this is not a divergence, it's an inner product. Uh, this has to be a vector. Where we're done now is a scalar. Okay, so I'm a little bit sloppy in my notation. So there's a vector part missing. What is the vector part? So it's pretending that they never been signing. What is the vector part missing? <laughs> <laughs> Now we can see my dot. Yes? Well, I guess if we take the dot product of r hat onto r hat, it's still going to point in the same direction afterwards. Well, yes, this r hat and the other r hat is going to give you one. Yeah. Because by definition, it's a unit vector, and the, the, the dot product of the vector itself is going to give you its length. So that's going to give us one. So we're going to drop the r hat in. That's absolutely true. Yes. But uh, why is it that there should be an R hat here in the first place? When I did this, I just wrote down the, uh, the chain rule without worrying too much about the vector. And we saw before that we have to be careful with these things. Maybe, maybe because of the way that the Nabla is defined for the system, That is certainly true, but. So it doesn't come with R somehow? Sorry. Does it have from with an R? No, really, right? Well, it's going to give you the derivative in the direction uh, of, 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 it's going to give you the direction of the thing of which you take the derivative. Yes, that's true, yeah. We're going to take an R derivative, so of course it's going to point in the R direction. So that's what this thing does. Just checking that we all have this. Now, uh, we already talked about this before. Uh, this vector uh, inner product here, this r hat and this r hat, are uh, only vectory parts, uh, going to give you the length of r hat, which is going to be 1. So all of this you can just replace by dt r of dr, d squared dtr squared of t r, uh, that one. And all of this you still have to divide by. All scalar. Almost done. Uh, because we have our two derivatives here. Yes? Now, do you agree with me that I might as well replace this by a only a time derivative, a non uh, retarded time derivative? I might as well drop the retarded thing here. Because you have some jangly rules, I guess. That, that's one way of putting it, but you can also immediately see it here, yes? Because as far as time is concerned, this is a constant. Yes. So I might as well replace this. That's good because that's what we want ultimately. Which is mathematically it's, it's identical. So the only thing we have to do is take this derivative. That would be done. So we have to take the retard time. We take its derivative with respect to r, small, uh, the ensuite r. Here's the definition. So what will we prove it to give us? Minus one over C. Minus one over C. Okay. Uh, squared. Um, I think it was one by R originally, like when you took the element from the left. Right hand. Yeah, I was, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I was thinking about that because this. Uh, uh, I was thinking. I was wondering where you are went, but I was sure that was just a, a copy. And yeah. I wrote an R squared here. When I copied this line, this thing to here, I actually wrote an R squared. And the reason that I already knew that that was going to give me an issue in a moment was because I know that this thing is going to give you the same thing as taking this derivative, and this one only comes with one R. But now that that is done, we see that we have full agreement, yes? Because this thing 
is exactly as if you would have taken two time derivatives of the full solution. So these are going to, be going to drop out. That's the final step in our proof. Deep side. I mean, it's many steps, but all the steps are things we see before. Yes, we use. We have to really make sure that when we use our product rules, that we apply the right one because they're now vector product rules. So we have really to check that this was the case. We have to use our previous result of the divergence of an r hat over r squared gives you 4 pi times the delta function. And the rest is just really working out with a chain rule built in here and there. But now the full, now everything is full. Any questions? Something you have to want to write out for yourself at home? I think you should, but um, if you haven't tried this, this person that you're seeing it, please do it yourself. You've now seen all the steps. But I'm sure you've seen that it all works out, yes? So Simon, thank you for that one particular step that went from here to here. I really didn't want to write it out. And uh, I didn't know it by heart, so thank you for that step. Um, yes? The derivation question is going to go on the exam. Could it also be something like this? No, not as not. This, 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 this takes too much time because you have to prove all these intermittent steps. I mean, it could it yes. be something mathematical as well. Yes, like it could be something, something mathematical, but I, I, with the exercise that I wrote is. It's already written. Yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> But I don't want to give too much away, but I can tell you it's not as extensive as this. It is something it is something with an integral bob. <laughs> what what's the price? Is there mathematics involved as well? Is there mathematics in the integral involved? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> I know. I got the joke. Okay guys. It took us a while, but ultimately we have a need that this thing is indeed a solution. Um, we have the minus sign issue. We have to check that I might have given you accidentally the Green's function with an overall minus sign because they use a different convention. Just to know where well, you know where that possibly could have come from, just for people who have seen this before, say relativity or so. Here's two spatial derivatives minus one over c squared times two time derivatives. This is what you get in relativity, yes. The square of a space minus the square of a time. So this is already fully relativistic. And from two weeks from now, I'm going to show you that it's not just the mathematical structure, that it really has all relativity already built in. Or, to put it in really strict terms, if you go to a random guy's other coordinate system, then you know how one guy's uh, 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 position and times change to some other guy's position and times. Yes. The answer is not time relation or subtraction, the answer is full Lorentz transformations. What we will show in two weeks is that the particular combination of two spaces and two times with an overall minus sign and c squared is invariant. You can lower transform, left to right, whatever you want. This particular combination is never going to change. And I, I, you were asking something about this because you mentioned that Chris had told you in the course that you took with him that there is a particular combination that should always give you minus c squared. Yeah. Right? That's what I'm talking about. Because the combination is a certain amount of duration of time and a certain amount of distance in space. Mm -hmm. If you go to some other guys' border system, the amount of time changes, the amount of distance changes, but that particular combination stays the same. And I'm going to explicitly prove, to prove that in two weeks from now. Now, once we've proven that, you have to accept this if you haven't really seen the proof before, but you can also see that this is going to always give you the same relationship, right? If you go to some other guy's corner frame, yes, it will be some other guy's derivative, time derivative, and some other guy's spatial derivative. And this number is different, and that number is different, but this combination will still stay to be the same. Or, as we say in relativity, this is an invariant. The equation is going to look the same in all order systems, no matter how hard you try to draw the transfer to someplace else. This number will change, that number will change, the combination will stay the same. Yeah, those are great because in relativity, in a world where amount of time, amount of space you know, is different from one observer to the next, you're looking for the things, the combinations that do not change because those you can trust everywhere. So if you are able to write your equations in such a way that you can change the inertial frame yet end up with the same equation, then you know that the equation is invariant, holds in all coordinate frames. So 
what I'm talking about now is that this equation is invariant. You don't have to worry about whether you are the right inertia frame. It always is because of this combination of space and time. Now, the minus sign thing I was talking about, I might give you one, uh, this one with an over minus sign. We'll have to check in break in a moment. The reason that, I, that, that that might have happened is if you have 2 times space minus 2 times time, it gives you minus c squared. And that is the same number in all inertial systems. Do you agree that first taking two space derivatives and then two time derivatives, you swap the order? Whether you first do two space derivatives minus two time derivatives, or first two time derivatives minus two space derivatives, in both cases will give you the same number in all the systems. Right? Well, I mean, the number will change. So, if you have the two space derivatives minus two time derivatives, it will give you minus c squared. Then, two time derivatives minus two space derivatives will give you plus c squared, agreed? Mm -hmm. So, the number will flip by a minus sign. But the fact that the number is then going to be the same all inertial systems, that is still true. The invariance is not changed. So, different authors of relativity uh, sometimes go it like this. That's fine, as long as you have an overall minus sign difference, you have an invariant. It's called the Lorentzian signature, yes. Just a question, is this um, equation invariant because we use this Lorentz gauge, or would it be invariant for any gauge? Change? That is an extremely good question. Yes, let's, let's discuss that for a second before the break. So, do you all get Lizzie's question here? Mm -hmm. Remember that we got this original equation that I've now already sort of told you for two weeks from now that it's going to be an invariant, it's going to be the same in all coordinate systems. We got this equation to begin with because we happen to have gone in the Lorentz gauge, yes? So, if you had not gone to the Lorentz gauge, you remember that the equation was much more difficult. This is a really big thing. So maybe us ending up in something that is invariant, the true in all spaces and times, is a consequence not of electrodynamics, but of this particular gauge that we have chosen. I think this is the heart of your question. Yeah, exactly. Like yes. how can we make sure that it's not just in this gauge that it is invariant in other gauges? Yes, I, I fully agree with the question. But so this is the question. Is the Lorentz invariance here the invariance for coordinate systems? Is that due to the to our particular choice of gauges, or is it always true? Who dares an answer? I guess it's always true because what the gauge transformation essentially does is change the mathematics to keep the physics yeah. safe, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the fact that it's invariant actually lies in the physics here, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So gauge transformation shouldn't make a difference. In yes. To be sure, it makes a difference in your mathematics. Your mathematics that you end up with might indeed itself not be. Gauge uh, a, a Lorentz invariant might, might might change from coordinate system to coordinate system, but we have explicitly proven that the resulting magnetic field and electric field do not change in any gauge. So the physics, the measurable physics, is certainly not going to change whatever gauge. So that's just a very roundabout way of saying that the agreement with special relativity is an actual. Um, statement of the theory itself and not of the gauge we've chosen. It's just that in this particular gauge it's most obviously stated because of this particular combination of two time derivatives minus two space derivatives. I think it's time for a break. All right, so after break, now that we've painstakingly proven this, let's go to exercise 10.12. 10, 10, 10. Oh, that was all the, the current, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do that one. Right. It's the following situation. You have an x-axis and you have a y-axis and along here you're going to have a wire and along this wire there's a current. This is the exercise. They state what the current is. 
there's a current going through here, da, da, da. and they say, well, the current in our particular case is some vector, I'm going to write down the vector, I'm just going to write this length, is time dependent. So the amount of current at any point in y is the same, but it will overall it will change in time. Okay? Now, the question that the exercise asks is, well, can we make the vector of potential, if you happen to be standing in the middle, how much vector potential you will find over there? Now, before we go into the, the meaty mathematics here, one, the, further on in the exercise, uh, they ask, also calculate, please, what the electric field is. Now, the electric field, um, you will not make not suspect, because you have a current. And currents do not produce electric fields. Right? And the wire is neutral, they say. Sure, there's electrons moving through the thing, but there's just as many protons, so it's electric and neutral. It's just that they're walking. So why why is there an electric field if there's no charge? Well, we have a magnetic field yeah. changing in time, and that induces an electric field. Well, we have so a current that is moving, that is changing in time. Well, presumably we'll also guess. Okay, we will have to check, of course, course. yes. Okay, so maybe you can already guess what mathematical property the electric field, I mean, yes, this is the reason. You have a changing uh, magnetic field. You, or at least we expect this, right? Because we're going to add, add, add more, more, more current. Um, and if you have a changing uh, current, you expect a changing electric field in time. And as you know, by Maxwell's third law, a changing magnetic field uh, will give you a, an electric field, right? Now, maybe you can already sort of guess what the electric field will look like. Will be a constant? Will it also increase in time? Will it decrease in time? Will it be exponential? Will be constant, will be constant actually, because we have constant increase in yes. current. Yes. And then dv dt will just give a constant. Okay. So what your your suggestion is that the current is going to change linearly in time. So the magnetic field you sort of extrapolate might also increase linearly in time. Yeah. And therefore, by uh, Maxwell's third law. If it increases linearly, you expect at least a curl of the electric field to be constant. Yeah. And then you have to still have to solve the electric field, but you know, solving the electric field from this thing will only change something spatially, right? So if you have the temporal behavior of the right hand side, then the curl on the left hand side is not going to change the temporal behavior. So if this thing is going to be a constant, you expect E to also be a constant. The only thing the curl can do is maybe point the thing in a different direction. But aside from that, you expect it to be constant. Does it make sense to you physically, though, that if you have a wire here, you stand here, you measure your electric field, and you add more and more current to the thing, literally in time, the electric field stays the same? Does it make sense? Does it feel good intuitively? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, yes, no. None of the above, that's also an option. I have no idea what feels intuitive here. I would try it. Okay. Well, there's a like one through the mathematics who hand waving in like it does feel a bit intuitive, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, I, I, at least that does. I, I tend to always think that intuition in physics is really just, you know, having done many exercises and thought experiments, at some point it feels logical to you. Well, let's see what, what happens. So, uh, suggestions. How to solve some integral version of the calculating the magnetic field. Yes, but the question is to calculate the vector potential. Uh, so what we can do, we can certainly first calculate the magnetic field and then get from that thing the uh, the vector potential to take the inverse curl. Mm. And inverse curl is by Stokes here means just a line integral over the uh, over the magnetic field. It certainly works, but the exercise wants you to calculate the uh, vector potential first. But didn't we just, you know, spend an hour or so yeah. writing down the general expression for the vector potential? So maybe we should start with this. And let's let, let's make sure that we have the, the minus sign right now. So the vector potential is given by this thing. Forget the minus that was going to have the opposite Lorentz's signature. There's a source. Our source in this case is going to be J. Our J moment is going to be current, dv, 
and this you have to do over all space. This we have phase taken and proved. All right. So we have the general expression. It's just we have to evaluate this graph. Hopefully it's not that crappy. This is not crappy yet. Oh, Can we turn the integral into a dl because it was only going along that line? Uh, yes. So, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, this is a volume current and it's perfectly fine. It's just in this particular case, it's a line current. So, yes, let's turn it into an integration over the line. So we don't have to integrate over all space, we just want to integrate over the wire. And then this gets replaced by. By i, be careful, it's a vector still. Uh, and it depends on things, yes? Now, this particular one happens not to depend on space. It does depend on time. So, no worries about sweeping r's here. Just put t here. Now, waiting for comp. T r. Ah, no, okay. Retarded time. Yeah. In fact, let's immediately write that down. Or time. Uh, that's k times t, but t has to be replaced by tr, and the retarded time is big R over c. I don't mean k is a function of t, t minus rc, I literally mean t minus rc is a number times k. In fact, let's take the k out, it's a constant anyway. And integrate this over wire. I'm sloppy in my notation because I've dropped the vector just now. Points among the path, the yeah. DL will always be per parallel to i. Uh, that's true. Uh, uh, our vector potential is, is parallel to, to i. Very different from Rio so far, where the magnetic field points are perpendicularly to uh, your, your current. Not so in vector potential, they point in the same direction, but the i points in different directions all over the thing. So, yeah, it's, it's not quite obvious. So, I think the best thing we can write here is times. I have. Okay. Um, the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, the current is given as kT and then you just replace T with retarded time okay. yes. immediately? Yes. Why? That's what, that's what our solution told us, yes. You have to write the source as a function of uh, as a function of retarded time. So you write down your source as given and replace all T's by TR's. That's all you have to do. And if you did have if it did have a spatial dependence, how would you well, suppose it was this. Yeah. Okay. Then, this would have been the whole expression, but again, t has to be replaced by retarded time. Mm -hmm. And every r in the expression has to be replaced by sweeping r. Then it would have been this. Uh, okay. Now, in our particular case, it just so happens that the thing is not position dependent, it's only uh, retarded time dependent, yeah. and, and that's what I wrote here. And the only thing that I did here with the i hat is take into account that the thing should be a vector. Be, because I'm just repeating what Nelson just said, basically. Mm -hmm. The L is also a vector, right? Uh, uh, no. Or is it not? It isn't, no. The R expression where the L itself is a vector, I agree, but not here. Okay. In, uh, the, 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 that's not because we went from volume to uh, a wire, from a three dimension to one dimension, but it has nothing to do with it. It is, has to do with the expression itself not having a vector at this point. All vectorness in the solution to uh, Laplace equation came from the source. What if, if we would have rewritten it in some way to a surface integral, then it would. Uh the A would be a vector or still not? Uh, actually, no. Uh, it, 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 uh, it still wouldn't. You have surface integrals where the surface vectorness comes in, and there are surface integrals where the vectorness does not come in. In this particular case, it simply does not. In case of BSFR, and, or a rewrite of the BSFR, yeah, remember, nice. there we had one, yes, because there was B times DA, where A being the, surf, the, the, the surface, and that one was a vector. But it's just different mathematics. So, how to continue from here? I guess we have to find the sort of 
find a detail that we're going to integrate over because we can be supposed to the path that we need to find a path that we integrate over. Yes. of many terms, yes? DL is tricky because it's not just one circle. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so it's two yeah. circles and a little straight side piece. Mm -hmm. So you have to break the so integral could, into two parts. Yeah. I, I think so. That's so you, you would make it a sum, maybe? Yes, mm -hmm. let's do yeah. this. Right, I mean, it goes to sum anyway. Yeah. Let's split it up in a couple of different parts. Uh, we can call this part one. The other Horizontal part is part two, part three, and here's part four. And just evaluate each of them individually. Size they call this A and this they call B. So, what are the integration patterns? From B to A. From B to A. This is where the minus B to minus A. What do you mean by I mean, it's two times that anyway. <coughs> I think you have symmetry on both sides, right? Okay. Although I don't know. They're going to cancel out. My claim is that one and two are going to cancel each other out. Maybe you can already tell why it will, either on mathematical grounds or maybe from a physical point of view. One is this from A to B and one is this oh. from B to A. Yeah. But why not? Shouldn't they sum up? Mm -hmm. They point in the same direction. Yes. That is true. Yeah. Yes. So one not of them, them. Yes. 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 But this is S argument. <coughs> one integral goes from B to A, the other goes from A to B. So you have two integrals that by themselves point in the same direction, but the order, the, the, the integration bounds change. Yeah. That gives an over minus sign. But this one, as we're saying, as you were saying, goes from minus b to minus k, and the other one goes from a to b. Mm -hmm. So you can put a, a minus and swap the two. I, don't uh, I, I understand the argument. Uh, if you do this from a magnetic field perspective, though, Okay. Yeah. Um, well, then actually, you have a perfect mirror image, right? Because the directions of the curves end up in mirror in this case. So you would expect them to add up then? Maybe. Yeah, I think there's a point there. Yeah. I think there's a point. I think they, they, I think they might actually add up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, if you use from a magnetic field point of view. Yeah, then the same argument holds. Yeah. Okay, from a magnetic field point of view, you would say something like, well, there's a current in this direction, so that means that the magnetic field is going to point in this direction or so. Right? Mm -hmm. And from the other side, it's going to do this. Uh, I think you also just use some symmetry argument or something like that. Doesn't matter if it comes from this side or from that side, they might be the same. I'm not really sure about the symmetry argument, though. Let's just go through the calculation, see what we end up. So half convinced of both arguments. Let's go through the let's go through the mathematics. Always one. That's always one. And in fact, it's the only way to prove something. So all right, suggestions. How to do this integration? Uh, you can maybe try to express capital R in terms of um, um, something else will X here. Maybe it's good to point out in the picture what the capital R is in the first place. What is capital yeah. R? Is it from your origin to the yeah. DL that you're evaluating? Well, I mean, this is the part of, of DL that you're evaluating, right? This amount of contribution to the vector potential here is what you're calculating. It happens to be at the position what we call R. 
in, in, uh, in our original expression. But it's uh, just x, yeah? Sorry? It's just x. Uh, the, 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 yes, that's just x. But it is also just capital R, isn't it? Right, because it would happen to be that we are in the center of our coordinate system and we're measuring where the thing is with respect to the center. So that means R, 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 <laughs> is capital R, too many R's here. So uh, I would say, so uh, this is also R, right? Capital R was. The, the, the location of this little piece of, of, of current with respect to us. Well, it's exactly with respect to us as it is with respect to the origin. Mm -hmm. So that means our uh, sweeping R is exactly capital R. So, that's good news because it's going to make our life a lot easier. And um, as I was saying, I think this is just X, right? So equation over X. So we get k over 4 pi, and yeah, let's be very strict here, it goes from minus a to minus b, minus b, minus a, uh, t minus r, which I think is just t minus x, over c divided by x, oh my god, what, what should we do with this particularly difficult interval? Please oh, no. Yes, no. Oh, I was being sarcastic, yes, no. <laughs> this is just a one dimensional, Life is rosy, all the birds and the flowers sing, and uh, this is a very easy integration. You don't have to worry about vectors. You don't have to worry about, oh, wait a minute, what is the angle between different arms and everything? This is very easy. Yes, let's split it up. Mu zero k, four pi, uh, t over x. It's integration in x direction, uh, plus, minus, oh. Just when you thought things could not get simpler, yeah. it's getting simpler. <laughs> things get simpler. Who dares? <laughs> really, no one. <laughs> I was expecting people to jump on this right now. I think it's one times ln of x divided from minus b to minus a. Of course, I agree. <laughs> and the other times is just going to be x divided from minus b to minus a. It doesn't really matter because they both come with their own minus sign, so the minus sign is in the logarithm of the Okay. okay. It, you would have more of a problem at the moment that, so good point, mathematical point here. Uh, what I did here is just ln and I put in minus a and minus ln minus b. But as you know, the difference of two logarithms is just the logarithm of the ratio. But the ratio has a minus a divided by minus b, so the minuses drop out. That's a good thing because otherwise you would have ended up with a logarithm with a negative number. But isn't the antiderivative of one over x lin magnitude of x? Isn't there already an absolute value? In yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, well, yes and no, because there's something that's called an analytic continuation, which means that you can also do it for negative numbers by including the, the proper amount of complex uh, values. Okay, I thought it, that was the antiderivative though. Or did we just put that there for Yes, that's what you just put there. In okay. complex function analysis, you drop these things because you can still continue with these things. It's literally called an analytic continuation. You can continue your calculation in the negative plane. 
Now here you don't have to because you drop out. Or okay, if you want, put absolute values that will, will drop out for that reason. Now that's only because we're just so lucky that we start integration here and we ended so on the left side, and we also ended on the left side. If A had been on the other side, you would have not have had one minus sign drop out. So this would have become well, some difficult to do my pick. Yes, but what, do you understand that physically? So if the integration had gone from some minus b to some positive a, then our expression here tells you, oh, well, then your, your logarithm is going to have a problem. Couldn't we have gone from minus b to 0 and from 0 to a? Yeah, the thing is that 0 or something crappy happens, right? Because the logarithm becomes minus infinity. But does that make sense from a uh, physics perspective, though? That apparently, if you want to calculate the vector potential here for a current that runs through you, you end up with infinity, an infinite amount of vector potential. But you said the vector potential doesn't have to make physical sense. It's no, that's, the, that's, that's true. The field has to make physical I, sense. I agree. Yeah. No, that is very true. Um, Yeah, because you still have to calculate the magnetic fields, I yeah. agree. But I'm just trying to think in, in the, taking the curl, mm -hmm. um, you might have that it still ends up gives you something because the curl at some point has you calculated x derivative mm -hmm. of ax, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that, that might still become an issue. Yeah. Now, we have to go through that exercise if you want, but Suppose that the blowing up carries over to the actual measurable magnetic field. Now that I don't find too strange to be honest. Because if you're going to calculate how much magnetic field you feel at the, at the position of your current, that is going to be the amount. It's like asking how many electric fields you have if you are at the center of an electron. Right? <laughs> now remember, the BOSFR tells you that the further, uh, in, in Coulomb, the further away you are either from a current or from a charge, the less of the field you're going to feel, right? It's a 1 over r squared, in case of uh, fields, the uh, magnetic and electric field. It's 1 over r in case of the potential and uh, scalar vector potentials. Well, then, if you are going to have zero distance from where the thing is originating, you will end up with infinity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too surprised that you would run into trouble when you go to integrate to the other side. When you let the curve flow through you. Remember, what the integration does is, is ask you each and every point of the current is going to give a contribution to your field. Well, one point is going to give you an infinite amount, mm -hmm. namely the one at your position. So, fortunately, no issue here. I think this is fully correct. I think we have the answer. Is it also multiplied by a uh, unit next term? The vector? Yes. Uh, I dropped that part out. Yes. All right, now, so we have this one. And I think without doing the full calculation, can we immediately write down the contribution to the, uh, this part? Uh, yeah. Can we just take unit vector x out of the integration? Because yes. Yes, you can. You're integrating with respect to x. That is true. But the unit vector only points in the direction. It's not a dynamical variable. It doesn't, it doesn't change. change. It, it, it has a unit amount, yes? so it doesn't add to the total outcome. In, 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 in a vector sense, it's, it's quite, it's very much a constant. It just tells you what direction it points without changing. Yeah. So it, it goes outside. Now, I'm just going to copy and paste this one for part three of the wire. Not too difficult, yes? You tell me what you change. You're now going to integrate from A to B, plus A to plus B. Or you just change the boundaries. I agree. Okay. So you're going to change the boundary. So it means that what used to say B should now say A, and what used to say A should now say B. Wait. What used to say minus B should now say A, and what used to say minus A should now say B. So let's copy paste this whole thing, replace A by minus b, which should be, uh, and replace b by minus a, 
these signs drop out. Then you, you can tell me that this term, the logarithmic term, and this logarithmic term are going to drop out against themselves, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the log of a over b is minus the log b over a. And you have to add all of this together, so this one is going to cancel that thing. So there's some canceling going on there. But not everywhere. Not everywhere, because I think the second term is going to survive. Mm -hmm. So it means that people were thinking, wait a minute, they should cancel out. And some people said, no, they should not. Well, for example, all, 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 all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, B minus A, let's do the same exercise. Uh, B should be replaced by minus A, and A should be replaced by minus B, that gives you the exact same expression. So yes, it turns out that these two terms are going to add up, and these two are going to drop out. When I made the exercise myself over the weekend, I don't think I asked myself the question if there's any physics we can put there that we get the log with so Is this a funny mathematical coincidence? Maybe we can, we can say something about it. Because remember that we said if you go from here and you would go over the wire. We would get the infinite amount, but we, we, the, the, the part that gave us the infinite amount is now going to drop out. No, if you have two infinites, they're not going to feel each other. If you go almost, if you go really close to zero, and you call that point your point B, for example, then yes. it will not even um, go up really fast because these are going to cancel out anyway. You see what I mean? Yeah. You I approach do. the zero point. No, I do. I mean, what you're saying is, let's say the limit a goes to zero. Let's do yeah. on the other side as well. Then, for all practical purposes, you're going to end up with a current running from minus b to b, right? Yeah. And we have happen. solved that exercise before. <laughs> so the funny thing is that only if the current really goes over this point, then it's going to blow yes. up. But if it comes really close, that's fine. Apparently, yeah. Yeah. So apparently. Um, I think in, in mathematics you do is an open dock. You're allowed to go over the thing, but not, not actually quite go. You have to jump over the thing. Okay, well that makes sense. So it's, it's almost like a full just you know full segment of wire, except that part where it's so soft or something. Okay, good. Great. Just my understanding, we have until four inch. No, not last week. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the beginning of this record, I really thought, okay, four. <laughs> right. Um, is it okay if we just go quickly to number three? Number four is exactly the same with some different boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to finish off the exercise. Okay. So, is this? Um, 
when I looked at the picture, I realized, wait a minute, my R, this number, that's this distance, yes? Mm -hmm. Or this distance, or that distance, or that distance. It, it's a circular segment, so R is going to be a constant. Oh. Yes. Okay. The constant actually has value A. So you can immediately say, well, it's going to be T minus A over C divided by A. DL. That is. With nothing in the end of so the so there's no L, no variable. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is actually quite easy. Well, we still have to integrate over the amount of wire, though. And be careful, we also have to take into account uh, its direction. Yeah, now that you and I change, right? Yeah, because yeah, the I changes itself changes uh, in which direction it points. So uh, we have to integrate over the amount of wire. Now that part is easy, right? And how much wire are you crossing at the moment you go through this? By R. This is pi A. Yes, pi a. Pi a. Yeah, sure, it's radius. But again, let's be careful here just for a second because we also have to take into account the directionality of the thing. This part. The resulting. Uh, well, I think they cancel each other out, right? On the vertical direction. Hmm. Yeah. Because it's right. symmetrical. Like, if the vector at the at a points upwards, the vector at the other a points downward. Yes. And so on and so forth. Yes. I mean, like, it's it's really symmetrical. So the the, the resulting vector will just be in the x direction. No? Uh, I agree. Yes. What does this i cancel out? Uh, the the, the, the y component of the is sorry. Yeah, see the direction of the current, yeah. how it goes? Yeah. If you start from minus a, yeah. it's straight upward. Yeah. So it's always tangent to the circumference. Yeah. And if you start from a, it's straight downward. Yeah. And you see that the vertical component, they always cancel out. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yes. In fact, uh, this is how I did it myself. Um, not by the symmetry argument. So for people who have difficulty seeing the symmetry, he's correct, he's correct though. I mean, there is a part of the current that's going to point upwards, but the same amount is going to point down with the other side of the loop. So these are going to cancel out. But the current that's going in the first direction is not going to cancel out from here to there, so these are going to add up. So you can immediately tell that the y direction vector potential is going to be zero, it's all of it is going to point in the x direction. Which is nice because these two also already pointed in the x direction. So by the same argument, this is also going to point in the x direction. So the whole, despite all the different changes of where currents go, everything ultimately will point in x direction. By the way, what what direction then will the magnetic field that we end up with going to point? X perpendicular. No, 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 no perpendicular. Perpendicular. Yes, but there's two perpendiculars here. So which one? Uh, <laughs> well, the potential is going to be in x for sure. Now, I agree. The whole the whole potential we can already see is going to point in that direction. Yes. What direction is going? Is the magnetic field going to point? Oh, it's like out of the board. That's going to be out of the board. Well, out of the board, but it means perpendicular in this case. Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. Really nice. But, uh, by the way, this is really just, you know, what you were learned in high school by you, but either hand, I have no idea which one you were told, but I mean, that if it, I mean, we already saw that it's going to add, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this great thing is going to make it stick out, but now you can already see that it will happen. Now, uh, just to quickly show you how I did it, this is easy, this part. This is a constant. Okay, for pi, t minus a over c, blah, blah, blah. that's all a constant, don't worry about it. Um, there's the L, and this directionality, um, the i, the piece of i that you have sticking here, is just the result of this triangle here, agreed? <laughs> And there's going to be an x component to that one, and it's going to be a y component. Now, if this is your angle phi, and you're interested in this amount, right, in which direction the i is sticking, can you convert that into terms of phi maybe? The direction in which i is going to point, you say, right? Yes. Because that's what we want. This one tells you for this amount of wire, it's going to be this vector. Maybe this is a tangent. formula for that, right? So tangent. Sorry. Tangent. No. 
Uh, yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, this is going to be a straight angle. Um, is it this here? Is it like this thing? Or is it that is a tiny correction, yes. Now, a little bit press on time here, but if there's one property of a circular orbit, that is that your directional motion is perpendicular to your radius. Yeah. Agreed? So, you're going to have a straight angle here, and this is going to have a certain angle there. I'm just going to copy um, Nelson's expression. It's minus sine phi, cosine phi. Yes. Zero. Okay. Now you might want to wait a minute. Where does the, the length of this thing go? Well, it's a unit vector, yes? It's i hat. So it, by definition, it should not have a length. And this one doesn't, because this thing squared plus that thing squared is the same thing one. So, now this integration you can now do. Because if you're going to integrate over the wire, the d of the wire, help me here for a second. Uh, because you, know, you have to integrate over the phi, yes? If you're going to integrate over the wire, your phi is changing along the way. So can you convert a dl into something that is a phi? It's a d phi. Missing something here, maybe? This is what we call Jacobians, yes? In, uh, yeah. Yes, Jacobians. Um, it so happens that it is, that you're right. It's, it's <laughs> like, yes. No, they, 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 I was thinking about the sine theta in between, but theta is how much you divert from. Mm -hmm. That's for spherical. That's for spherical. Well, yes, but. Yeah. but uh, a circle is just a flattened version of spherical. It just means you have yes. put your your theta to pi over two. Yeah. Anyway, now I'm going to let you go in a second. But just this thing itself is the a times the phi that you have to integrate over. So you have to integrate this thing. Agreed? Now what are what are the values that you integrate over? Um, your phi go from what number to what number? Um, minus pi is the lowest one of the Zero is the upper one. Yes, because you define phi such. You start here, go to minus pi to the other side. The antiderivative of the sine is the cosine. Yes. Uh, you put in uh, minus pi, gives you minus one. And you subtract all from that, you subtract the cosine of zero, gives you another minus one, gives you minus two. This one has as its antiderivative the, the sine. And if you put in minus five and zero, both of them are zero, cancel each other out, and you end up that this part will not contribute, you only get an answer. Exactly as we predicted by students' your arguments. Okay guys, so I took longer. Then again, I gave you ten minutes to look up Stefan Hilt on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so four goes the same, yes? So you get your full expression for the amount of vector potential, take this curl, you can end up with your magnetic field. Yeah. 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 Yeah.